It is true that history can be long and boring, but why studying history? Take note of this, what happened and when it happened. For example, Thomas Morgan postulated the concept of self-linkage in what year? In 1910. Another important fact that you have to take note of why studying history is how. How did it happen? This explains the process involved. So, we are going to look at seven things that happened in the history of genetics. Number one, the early nomadic tribes. What happened? Selective breeding. When did it happen? In the old stone age. Now, how did it happen? Organisms with desire traits were allowed to mate with one another. For example, race horses have long legs. So, only those race horses that had long legs were allowed to mate with one another because it produced the desired traits that these tribes wanted. Number two, we are going to see another set of people that contributed immensely to the history of genetics, and that is the Romans. They also did selective breeding, but not just of animals, of plants such as rice, maize, and other crops. And they did this over 2,000 years ago. The third contributor is Hippocrates. In the year 400 BC, he was regarded as the father of medicine. He postulated the theory of pangenesis. What this means was that parents could donate seeds to form babies after sexual intercourse. Seeds from the eyes, from the nose, from all the organs of the body. And that is why it's called pangenesis. But they did not know that those seeds would later be known as genes. The fourth person is Aristotle. Aristotle talked about the theory of inheritance via blood. He said that semen is a kind of purified blood and that the semen from the father and the messes from the mother produce the baby. He said that hereditary materials are transferred to baby via both parents' blood. It was during his time we began to hear things like bloodlines, blue blood and all of that. The fifth person is Gregor Joan Mender. is the father of genetics. Gregor Mende was well known for his work with pea plants. He worked on 34 varieties of pea plants. These are the various contrasting pear traits he worked with. For example, in seed form, was either round or wrinkled. The seed color, yellow or green. The pod form could either be inflated or constricted, so on and so forth. We are going to look at the work that Mende did and how he contributed immensely to the course of the history concerning genetics. He crossed varieties of different contrasting paired traits. For example, he could cross for height and all of that for seed color. He said uh, he crossed yellow and green. For flower color, he crossed for purple and white, so on and so, on and so forth. Then he discovered that one of the traits was always dominant. For seed shape, round was dominant, wrinkled was recessive. For seed color, yellow was dominant, green was recessive. For flower color, purple was, or violet was dominant, then white was recessive. For pot shape, the full pot shape was always dominant over the constricted. Pot color, green, was always dominant over the yellow. For flower position, the exile was always dominant over the terminal. And then for plant eyes, the tall plants were always dominant over the dwarf or the short plants. He said that the expressed trait rather was dominant and the repressed trait was recessive. But it did not just stop there. There are some other factors he put into consideration. He crossbred the progenies that showed only one dominant trait. He discovered a new ratio. They were not just all dominant, but the recessive traits came out and resurfaced. So the dominant to recessive was 3 ratio 1. The recessive traits that were masked in the F1 generation resurfaced. But there were lots of questions in Mendel's mind. How did this happen? Why was it that the recessive trait was masked and all of that? Let's put the character of plant height into consideration. Let's say we have the tall trait crossed with the short trait. What do you think is going to happen? Of course, we are going to have all tall plants in the first generation. But let's understand the concept of crossing. When you are crossing and you are doing self-pollination, you transfer the anther of one flower 
of the same flower to the stigma of that same flower and it fertilizes with the ovule to produce a seed. This is a perfect example of self-pollination. But if you are doing cross-pollination, you want to take the anther of a particular flower, please do not take it to the same flower stigma. That would be wrong. That is self-pollination. But you transfer it to the stigma of another flower. This is what Mende did when he was crossbreeding. Two pea plants of contrasting traits. It was such a lengthy exercise, not as normal as we would think. For example, let's say this flower is tall and the other flower is a short uh, plant. It would transfer pollens from the anther of this tall one to the stigma of the short one and then they will produce seeds and it will plant them and allow them to grow and germinate. Then, if, for example, if we say 24 seeds were planted, all 24 after germination and maturity were all tall. And we call that the first filial generation. From these 24 that were matured, he allowed them to self-pollinate. And he once again got their seeds from self-pollination and planted them. So there's a new question. If 24 seeds were planted from this self-pollination process, will all the progenies in the F2 generation be tall? We already know the answer that is 3 ratio 1, right? Let's say the 24 is divided into 4 equal parts of 6. 3 out of that part will be tall. That is 18 plants will be tall. And then only one will be short. So you understand when we say 3 ratio 1, it does not actually mean that it is 3 plants that was matured. It's just saying that the ratio of the plants, the tall plant to the short one, was 3 ratio 1. He also considered two and more characters at once. For example, plant eye, seed color, pot shape, flower color. He just did everything at once to see if they would affect one another. But to his surprise, he got the same result in the F1 and F2 generation for all the traits. This brought a new law into consideration, the law of independent assortment. He said that the alleles or the gene variant of two or more different genes get sorted into gametes independently of one another. This implies that traits do not affect one another when they are passed to the next generation. For example, plant eyes do not affect the color of the petals. The color of the petals do not affect the pot shape. The pot shape will not affect the shape of the seed and all of that. They are all transmitted to the next generation without affecting one another. That's why we say independently of one another. I hope you understand. So, from his knowledge of fertilization, he knew that the sperm plus the egg is going to give you a zygote. Now, look at this. Does this make sense? The zygote is a tetraploid. It does not make sense at all. Diplot plus diplot is equal to tetraploid? No. For the egg and the sperm to retain the zygote diploid nature, it has to be haploid plus haploid equal to diploid. So, two of these variants for a diploid organism, we have to separate into the sperm or the egg. It must not be two of them in the sperm or the egg cells. What do you think these will separate into? So because genes can separate or segregate into either the sperm cells or the egg cells, a new law was brought into place. That is the law of separation or the law of segregation of genes into gametes. And this law states that each individual that is a diploid has a pair of alleles for a particular trait. That means there are two alleles for tallness. There are two alleles for shortness. How many laws can we state due to Mendes' work? There are three, if you think about it, although I did not mention the first one. The law of dominance states that when two plants of contrasting traits are crossed with one another, only the dominant traits will be expressed. The law of independent assessment and, of course, the law of segregation. The law of independent assessment has already stated that when traits are passed to the next generation, they do not affect one another. And the law of segregation says that genes must be separated into gametes. So why do you think Mendes 
work was different from those before him? Yes, because of the scientific evidence that he had. The next on our list is Sutton and Bovary in the year 1902 and 1903. They were working independently. That means they were not working together, but they were working within the same time period. And both of them coincidentally proposed the chromosomal theory of inheritance. What does this mean? Well, it means that genes are found on chromosomes. Genes are found on chromosomes. And that the behavior of those chromosomes during meiosis or meiosis explains Mendes' three laws. What are the three laws? The law of dominance, law of independent assessment, and law of segregation. The last on our list is Thomas Morgan in the year 1910. He talks about cell linkage. That means that genes are only found on either the X or the Y chromosomes. He worked with Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, when he bred the male white-eyed variants with the female variants. He discovered that all the progenies from the F1 generations had red eyes. Then he allowed them to mate with one another. So if we're looking at 12 flies, for example, this would have been the results from Thomas Morgan's experiment. Take a look at it carefully. So out of 12 flies, 6 were females and 3 were males with red eyes, but only 3 males with white eyes. It was surprising that we still had the same 3 ratio 1 as with Mendes' work, but one thing was put into consideration. None of the female had white eyes. It was only the males that had white eyes. So, in conclusion, the genes for eye color can only be found on the S chromosome of either the male or the female. And also, the gene for white eye color is linked to the male S chromosome. X, no female fly, can have white eye color. This was the concept of cess linkage. Thank you. Yeah.